good morning. I'm Alessandro Carpi. Uh, I uh, run the test engineering at uh, Juniper Abstra. And um, my team responsibility is uh, primarily in two functions. One uh, is um, deliver the uh, uh, testing, both uh, exploratory and uh, automated, of our product. And, uh, but more importantly, I believe uh, we, um, we deliver the infrastructure that allows to deploy our product, uh, not only within the testing team, but uh, across uh, actually the entire organization, being uh, uh, engineering, sales, support, uh, and uh, field teams, so that uh, um, whenever they use our product, whenever they want to play, or they want to develop on our product, they actually run the real stuff. So our controller actually talking to real devices, real topologies, being this physical, virtual, or a, or a mix of both. Um, so uh, today, as a DJ as, a, as a mentioned, I'm going to show a bit of a fun use case of a Freeform that I used to uh, play with this feature and validate uh, some uh, uh, non-trivial aspect uh, of these features, uh, such as uh, uh, config rendering and, uh, and scale primarily. So um, I, I'll show you how uh, you can build uh, a uh, custom topology, so going uh, beyond uh, the, the usual uh, um, uh, IP fabric use case that you've seen probably in past years. Uh, how you can build a custom network uh, with a um, significantly complex topology, but uh, uh, where the configuration is more or less consistent across all the nodes, uh, and, uh, uh, and you can fit some dynamic part into these configurations. Uh, this to showcase a bit the uh, flexibility and simplicity of abstract form, uh, a bit uh, how the UX uh, looks like. Uh, and uh, highlight some of the core benefits of our product from uh, uh, day zero, when you are designing this network, you don't have the, the actual network uh, present, to uh, uh, day two operations like uh, maintenance and so on. And uh, uh, this essentially to, 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 sh to show how, how you can build this network at your own pace, uh, how you can play with it uh, before you even uh, uh, push it on onto the, the real devices. So, there is a bit of a backstory to this uh, fun exercise, uh, which is this blog post that I linked. Um, I don't know, probably you have read it. Um, basically, the, the author of this blog post, Ben Jojo, uh, tried to um, use uh, BGP to, to model uh, um, uh, a map, basically, a geographic map. So uh, essentially say how I can use BGP to, um, um, to be my uh, Google Maps, basically, to, to, to tell me information, how I can go from CDA to CDB. Um, using uh, uh, reachability information provided by BGP. And uh, um, in this model, uh, each station, uh, uh, I mean, it started with an with a online gaming uh, um, uh, map, which was pretty big, and then it fell back because of the scale to the London subway system map, which is around 300, 310 nodes. So, and uh, the cool idea here was uh, each station in the London subway system map is actually a node in, on our, um, in our network. And the station uh, are connected. Uh, um, uh, so the, the connection between stations is uh, modeled as a link uh, with a BGP peer. And, um, and uh, there is BGP peering between stations. And of course, uh, the, uh, the shortest path from uh, station A to station B is not the minimum number of hops you can traverse uh, to get there. But you have to model some uh, latency information between these links. Uh, uh, for example, how many seconds it, 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 it takes uh, to get from station A to station B. And it's, it's done uh, that using uh, BGP meds, uh, multi exit discriminators, to model this latency. So that basically the path from station A to station B is uh, the cumulative value uh, of all the links you are traversing. So when, you, um, when eventually you see trace route, uh, you actually get the real path uh, as, uh, for example, Google Maps will tell you, and you are reusing BGP to get there. Um, now, in this blog post, uh, uh, Ben generates these uh, routers config using uh, uh, ad hoc uh, code. Like he is a is uh, a um, is a math scientist, so basically he, he built this configuration using Go, and then he spun a minimal Ubuntu distribution running probably Bird uh, to um, where the, the the configuration was pushed as a static file, and that's where uh, basically the, um, where um, our uh, our um, the, the idea to use Freeform to to ext extend on this uh, fun use case. Uh, and see how, how we can, um, uh, we can uh, improve on this, uh, on this fun exercise. So my main question was uh, how actually we can build uh, these uh, configurations uh, in a way that is um, composable, for example. So you have uh, uh, usually in a, in a router configuration, you have a section for interfaces, a section for protocols, then a main section with the host names and other attributes. Uh, um, how you can uh, 
model these individual parts and compose them to, together in a way that is sensible and uh, maintainable, for example, if, uh, if you have to apply the same uh, paradigm to, to uh, build a real uh, network configuration. Um, how you can do this uh, programmatically, but without necessarily bring a, a programming uh, um, stack into it, like Golang, a uh, build uh, tool chain, and so on. So you need some uh, concept of programming languages, like uh, uh, selection, uh, loops, and so on. But how you can do it in a way that is uh, sandboxed and uh, uh, without being necessarily familiar with uh, any programming languages. And uh, more importantly, especially for us, uh, uh, how you can do it in a, in a closed loop, in an intent-based way. Uh, so there is much more than just pushing configuration on the devices, right? So you want to run continuously tests on this infrastructure to understand if, uh, um, if there is a link down, a BGP flapping, or anything that uh, uh, eventually shows that there is a malfunctioning uh, uh, and a, a divergence from the original intent. So, um, and how we can help with upstream reform, right? So essentially, um, uh, we can model anywhere, uh, any network uh, you want uh, in this case. Uh, and for this specific use case of the London uh, subway system, uh, um, you can have actually the same config template uh, with uh, multiple data, which means uh, you can extrapolate the, the, the common part of this configuration and feed into these uh, uh, data variables that are actually coming from, uh, from uh, uh, what we call device context, which is a, uh, a representation of the, all the information that AppStar knows about the device. Uh, Placed in a convenient way so that uh, you can actually refer to these variables and you can navigate into this data structure. Um, how you can model, uh, how you can extend uh, into this information using what we call property sets uh, to model other stuff, for example, that Tapstra uh, doesn't know yet. For example, uh, if you want to add information about uh, mapping between the station and uh, each autonomous system number, uh, loopback interfaces. So you can feed into this uh, as a user using uh, uh, what we call property set, uh, which is essentially a, a dictionary. So it's the equivalent of a Python dictionary. So you have a key and value. So the most uh, flexible data structure you can think of basically. And you can nest uh, arbitrarily these, uh, these, uh, these uh, key values so that uh, you can feed into the product and you can still access to the same editor, basically those variables. And um, you have uh, in addition, inter-based analytics, for example, to aggregate output from multiple uh, diagnostic commands. Uh, when you see trace route, for example, and you have a network like this, uh, trace route just tells you uh, the number of hops you are traversing, but maybe you want to know how long it takes from, from, uh, to, from station A to station B. And uh, uh, this uh, requires another output uh, coming from short routes, for example, to see this, uh, what is the MED, the aggregated MED uh, for this route. Uh, and you can present this uh, in a cohesive way, right? Uh, in a way that uh, makes sense for the user eventually. Uh, this is a specific uh, exercise uh, just for fun, right? But uh, uh, I'm pretty sure this is a common problem where you, you have to run multiple commands to, to get uh, a sense of what's happening to one system and uh, you, you want to present it in one number, for example, right? And, um, and you can have, uh, uh, as is a controller that makes use of uh, agents to manage these devices. Uh, you can actually push configuration on, the, on these devices using uh, our uh, agents infrastructure. So if you have to uh, push configuration all at once, uh, you can simply click a button and this configuration will go into, into all these devices. Okay, so could you expand just a little bit on the, the variables and property management? Obviously, I've got to talk to my DNS system to get host names. Mm -hmm. I've got to talk to an IPAM to get IP addresses. I've got another database somewhere that mm -hmm. ASN assignments and things that are... So what does that integration look like so that, you know, for dozens or hundreds of devices, I'm pulling the right data for the right host. Okay, so we, we do expose, uh, uh, currently uh, our products expose the REST APIs. So what, uh, what you can populate as a user is a, is a key value store. Now, how you get into that is uh, by pulling into your uh, source of truth in this case, uh, and uh, for example, periodically refresh this information into our product. Now we can probably, uh, port, uh, probably as part of professional services, we can, we can uh, probably enable adapters to do that. But eventually this information is to go from, uh, from your source of truth into the product uh, through some uh, API that we, we can define. So essentially we expose a flexible data structure for that, uh, that the user can feed into in by typing into the product or feeding it uh, automatically by, by having an adapter for that. Okay, so do you usually see customers doing that as a push from the outside into your API or, or the reverse? 
we I think we have seen both essentially. So uh, mm -hmm. if you want to use Abstra uh, as a resource allocation, uh, uh, like to to allocate uh, what we call resources, which could be IP addresses, ASN numbers, and so on, you can use uh, our resource allocation logic to to get the next available one, for example. Okay. And then you have some way to consolidate this information into your IPAN system, for example. Or you can do it the other way around. So I, I think we have seen applications of both essentially. You can essentially consume APIs from yeah. other systems, bring that data in, and then use your system to push. Okay, okay. correct. So you're, yeah. you're flexible either way. I can have like an order that comes in that gathers that from the customer order, pulls that information and pushes it into you, or I can have you generate, you know, this is the service I'm going to create in Astra. So in order to create that service, I need this information and pull it in the other way. Yes, I think you have, uh, you have both, uh, both options if you want. Uh, we, we simply expose APIs for that, either to read or to write into it. Right. Yeah, because what, we, what we've seen on that one is a lot of customers have pieces of it, but not all of the things. And so they're looking for, I mean, you touched on single, the, the source of truth. I think maybe that's the industry, true. yeah, industry gets wrapped around. There's no single source of truth yet. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we act as a single source of truth for the data center pieces here, but we're not the only one. There's other sources of truth. I mean, he named off five or six of them. And so, but many people may not have, you know, may not have an IPAM or may not have, like, what is the single source of truth for ASNs? And so the, the, yeah, yeah. Gotta put them in a database somewhere. And yeah. And so that is, they store them, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that's where we come in is we, it's, we're flexible enough to take outside sources through API, or if you don't have these capabilities or AppSure is that source of truth for this information. Okay. So I could, I could do it there if I'm not already collecting it somewhere else. Right. Now, uh, Back to the London subway system example, this is how the, the map looks like with a set of stations and link uh, between stations. Uh, but uh, now we have somehow to populate this map into our product. Uh, and uh, we don't want to do that manually using uh, the canvas that DJ has just uh, presented before, right? So we, we do expose APIs though. And uh, uh, we actually got an input file uh, from, uh, from the, the blog post that I linked. Uh, and we enriched a bit uh, uh, on that. Essentially, this JSON file has uh, uh, very simply two sections, one for stations. So each station has an ID, a name, and actually we add the latitude and longitude of these stations and the zone so that uh, uh, we can actually create a geographically accurate version of that map. So we can place it in, a, in the canvas in a, in a nice way. And zone actually the same, we can place a color, for example, to each zone. Uh, and uh, connections in between stations very simply you know, identifying uh, from which station to which station and what is the latency. So now you can imagine that latency is in seconds. Uh, that translates into BGP uh, language uh, into the, the MED attributes that eventually we will add for those links. Uh, so that eventually we get this uh, uh, reachability information using, uh, using BGP. And uh, I'm gonna show you uh, how this looks like. This is how it looks like. So uh, essentially we have this very complex network uh, this is uh, uh, each each uh, rectangle is a station of the London uh, of the London subway system, and uh, uh, you can see uh, the the names here. You can see connections. Uh, colors are essentially identifying the zone. So you should see that uh, it gets more dense in the center, and then it, it gets more sparse uh, uh, going out. Now, um, this is just to uh, now if you if you. If you place each of these stations on Google Maps, you'll see exactly this, uh, this picture. So this is just a, a fun exercise to basically populate uh, uh, the network from, from, a, from a source, uh, which is, uh, in this case, the, the input file. So we're going to focus on a very specific section of the map. Um, so let me, let me show you one thing um, in particular. So we have uh, uh, 310 stations here. Um, so each station has a name has a um, host name, which is a, a, a how do you say, a slugified version of the, of, the, of the name in particular. Um, now, this actually is a real topology uh, with 310 uh, uh, virtual Junos devices that we have deployed in our, in our, in our network. So what I show you is actually a real topology now. And uh, uh, you have this list of stations uh, with the device profile Juniper. You have uh, the, links uh, in between stations. So we have uh, um, all the links uh, model. So you can see the source and destination. 
we have a, uh, probably I can zoom a bit, we have a, a slash 31 IP address. Oh, okay, there is some delay, yeah. There is a slash 31 uh, in between these stations and uh, uh, the latency information is modeled in um, what we call tags. So tags are uh, generic uh, uh, stamps that you can put on, on objects in abstract, which could be systems, could be links, uh, could be anything other object. So we're essentially trying to um, put uh, this information on, uh, on the link object so that we can access this information from the config rendering engine. And you can uh, uh, you know, replace, uh, you, you can create a BGP session with, uh, with this information that is coming from, uh, from this uh, device context that we mentioned before. And um, now there are uh, um, other, uh, um, other elements on these topologies. Uh, we have uh, um, the, the parts uh, in the configuration that model, um, uh, the parts that essentially model the configuration. So we have three sections essentially. So this is showing the composability of configuration. We have three section systems, uh, modeling the host name, for example, interfaces, uh, modeling the, the interface uh, IP address and status uh, and protocols modeling the BGP stuff. So uh, we can uh, um, show, for example, uh, interfaces, how interface looks like. And uh, here uh, actually, Oh, here, essentially, I, I can open an editor here. Uh, this to show the, 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 the power of uh, this config rendering and the ID like uh, um, user experience. So you can see there is a, this configuration is templatized. So for example, we, we removed uh, the dynamic part of this configuration, which will come from uh, uh, the device context. So for example, we have a section modeling each interface. We have uh, uh, populated information uh, uh, regarding what is the IP address and subnet. So you can use this uh, in the interface section, for example, uh, to model, uh, uh, to do this variable substitution from device context. So all this information that you see on the right uh, is accessible on the left side. And um, this, is a, um, this data structure is essentially um, uh, modeling the, 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 um, all the information available for the device. You can search for it, uh, for example, uh, I can, I can filter uh, uh, how I can fetch uh, host names. And this is uh, extremely convenient uh, because, uh, for example, uh, if you focus on the interfaces section, right, uh, Appstra is actually giving you not only information about this device, uh, but you, you can get uh, information about what is my neighbor interface uh, and the uh, host name. So that, uh, uh, um, for example, you can look up uh, into, you can use this information to look up what is the SN number that uh, you need to peer with. So it's all there uh, and you can simply access with a variable uh, uh, substitution with this uh, double uh, uh, curly, um, curly uh, bracket that you see there. And um, just real quick, and, th and that's, a, that's a big point to grasp here is that it's just not data that's existing in a structure. It's part of the graph database, so it's relationship based. So you can say, who is my neighbor dynamically, even if you add a new neighbor and say, give me the ASN of my neighbor. And if that neighbor changes, it's automatically populated. So you don't have to encode that logic. This is, you know, not only this, the, the context is important, but it's the relationship of the graph database that he's accessing. that is very differentiated. And uh, um, you can actually see uh, eventually how the configuration looks like in, uh, in, uh, in real time. So you can get a config preview here and you can see uh, how we render this configuration as seen by the system name they wrote, for example. So you can see the inter your interfaces sections, you can see your B policy sections, BGP protocols, uh, host name, for example. And um, you have that uh, uh, accessible for, for any device that you have in your network, essentially. So you can see now just which uh, system and the host name, for example, has changed. So um, this uh, essentially gives you a, an immediate way to validate uh, uh, what, what, we're, uh, what we are uh, generating here that actually can render properly. You're accessing variables, the right variable, the right, uh, the right way, and so on without even uh, pushing this configuration on the, on the devices. And, and how much of this is already existing in, in templates that you're generating from and how much of it had to be created, you know, based on what you're planning on doing in your model? Uh, so this is completely from scratch. So in this model, I essentially took uh, how, what, let's focus on one device, right? So you have a protocol section an interfaces section and, and uh, system section, right? Right. So essentially you take the common part, uh, you templatize that, uh, and uh, the dynamic part of it uh, is a variable. So this is uh, completely from scratch this build. So um, that's that's the power that you have here available, as opposed to the turnkey, turnkey um, 
version of the product where uh, if you want to model a, co a complex network, meaning uh, uh, an IP fabric, uh, uh, you don't essentially you don't have to write any configuration for it. So this is uh, opening up our rendering engine basically. So uh, this configuration is written from scratch, but when you render it, uh, uh, you can see that uh, there are three Jinja templates here. It's probably 30 lines of code each, and you have a full configuration eventually pushed into the device. But the nice uh, thing of this model, uh, that's the reason actually why I presented it, is uh, you have a single config multiple data kind of model. So the configuration will look like exact, almost exactly the same on all devices. You have one template for all the devices, as opposed to the, the use case that DJ has presented as a talk before, where you can get started with this product by simply fetching configuration from all devices and have individual config templates. So that's, I would say it's a step zero to use this product. Then you look at the configuration, you look at the patterns and you try to templatize the common parts. Uh, and this is the, the extreme end of that, right? So you have one config for all the device. If your topology, your network design allows you to do that. So uh, depends what you're building essentially. Eventually we want to push this configuration on the devices, right? So I, know I, I want to show you how Traceroute looks like. Now, if I had to jump on one of these devices, uh, this is the station I rode. And uh, uh, actually let's go back into the map. I want to show you um, first, uh, let's focus our attention on one specific portion of the map, right? So let me load this map again, and uh, I'll focus on, uh, on the section around Abbey Road. So uh, I'm gonna show you a trace route uh, in between stations that are uh, three or four hops away. So uh, let's search Abbey Road in this map. So it's right here. I can uh, zoom a bit. Let me fix a bit this. I can zoom, okay. I think you can see it. Okay, so we're, let's say we want to jump to, uh, from, from Station Abbey Road to uh, sta a station called Bow Road here. And um, uh, now, if you have to do that, you have two options essentially. This is what the, the topology uh, is showing you. You can go south through West Ham or you can go north. Um, so I'm not sure which one is, uh, is the shortest path. So let's have uh, BGP figure it out. So I jump into the device Abbey Road. Now I try to do, Trace route, uh, power road, and this doesn't work. It doesn't work because uh, uh, we essentially uh, uh, don't have a DNS servers right now. So uh, now I want to fix this. Now, if we if we in a, if we if we have to do the right thing, we probably had a DNS server with all this information. Uh, but uh, we have an automation tool that can push configuration on 300 devices at once. Uh, so let's do something a bit crazy. You can have uh, a mapping between stations and all the IP addresses of all the interfaces uh, associated to this, uh, to this uh, router, right? So essentially we could, uh, if we have a, a static host mappings, uh, mapping all these, uh, we could push uh, all this configuration at once on these devices. So you're essentially replacing a DNS server with a bunch of uh, static host mappings uh, uh, that are pushing on 300 devices, which is pretty crazy. But I want to show you how to push configuration on all the devices at once. Um, I have a, uh, conveniently, I have a Jinja template for this, uh, which actually I, uh, so this is a static host mappings here with uh, uh, each uh, um, station, essentially the IP address of the peer links. Uh, the funny thing of this is that actually is uh, uh, populated from uh, the same graph database. So I can use uh, Abstra to, to get uh, via REST API that the information you've seen in the table before, and actually I can push this, uh, uh, this dynamically into, into the device. So I have uh, 310 uh, uh, static host mappings now, and I want to push it on, on all the devices. <laughs> so <laughs> so we'll, we'll introduce you to DNS servers at some point. <laughs> <laughs> this is a DNS uh, before the DNS, right? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, I have uh, this system section here. Actually in Jinja, you can use uh, this syntax uh, like curly bracket and pound to comment. Uh, and now we're gonna uncomment this thing. And uh, essentially uh, we should be seeing uh, in the preview, now a huge section uh, with uh, static host mappings here. So in real time, as rendered by the station at road, but it's gonna be the same everywhere essentially. So you have the static cost uh, uh, mapping section here, and then you have your interfaces and everything that was there already before. And uh, I'm updating this. Uh, 
this will trigger in the product a diff that says, hey, your config template has changed. Now, uh, do you want to push it, essentially? So uh, now uh, let's push it on all the devices. Uh, uh, and he ask you, this, this uh, uh, description allows you to track the re different revisions whenever you make uh, a configuration change. So what I'm going to say here, who needs uh, a DNS server, essentially? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, now I'm committing configuration and uh, you will see a number bumping into, from pending into succeeded. So 310 is the, the final state. Now you see uh, it's uh, almost all done. It takes a couple of uh, uh, UI refreshes to get there. You are actually seeing in action uh, a config push on 310 devices. And you see now 310 devices are green, which means uh, configuration has been pushed uh, successfully. How is the GUI refreshed? I mean, I mean you're pushing it just incrementing over time. So how does, how does that work? Is that a event push from the config? Well, I don't know, I'm using the wrong term. <laughs> no, I, I think I got it. I think I got it. Yeah. So um, we use a declarative, so this goes a bit in the internal. I love to talk about this. I'll tell you very briefly what it is. This goes a bit in the internal. So we have a declarative model. So we have a distributed data store. So what this changes is there is a new config rendering. I update a state in my distributed data store. The agents react to this change. They read it and they push it on the devices all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the GUI is essentially a, a REST API client for, for our controller. Mm -hmm. So this refresh uh, is not necessarily uh, reflecting that uh, I'm, uh, um, um, I'm pushing this configuration on the devices. Somebody has reacted to event config change and pushed the configuration locally to the device. Mm -hmm. So I could write my own and have it sit in my own browser. Oh yeah, yeah. this is a, a REST API client. Yeah. I could say, oh, no, someone may change. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is essential REST API client. Uh, as part of my job, I use APIs all the time to, to validate these without a browser. And uh, essentially, I do that. And uh, actually, if you open the inspector in the browser, you see all the REST APIs being called. And I use that actually to teach myself which API I should do that to, to, to get this status. So in your uh, demo uh, network, you've got the red line and the green line. Mm -hmm. And, and yellow. Now you've talked about pushing config kind of just flat through the whole, all of the devices network. Mm -hmm. so that's great. If I want to make a config change on just the yellow line, okay. uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the capability to do sure. that? Or maybe I want to do a config change and I want to, I want to cover green and blue, mm -hmm. but not red. Okay. Um, can you, can you go into that a little bit? Yes. So you can do this in two ways, right? So if you want to stay faithful to your uh, model, uh, have one template uh, that eventually uh, pushes to, to all the devices. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to stay faithful to that model, you don't want to have a special case Jinja for one device, for example, sure. you can use selection for that. You can have an if block in the config template that says, uh, if the host name or the device is this, then this is the configuration I render. Or, or you can map uh, one specific config template to one device. You, you have the options to do both. Uh, depends how, how uh, you know, how, how do you want to structure your templates in a way that is cleaner and maintainable for you. Right. So that's... But, uh, that's I guess, uh, get a little bit more... Uh, kind of like what I'm looking at is what's the capability to support a group? So I want to put push the same config mm -hmm. to all of the stations that are yellow. Yeah, so you you can have uh, um, you can have tags uh, mm -hmm. marked uh, on these uh, on these systems. Uh. So I so when you had the the um, the um, interface up the last time, it, it, you just had a single tag. Do you support multiple tags? Oh yeah, the tag is essentially a data store for uh, any label you want to put that. Okay. So you you can put multiple tags. You can have the color there for the link. Uh, uh, you want to add the... Yeah, I was going to say, well, well, you'll see a bit of this in the, in the drain. Yeah. But look, one topology that I built, I use a tag, and I say um, firewall or if BGP. Mm -hmm. So I can say, if this interface that I've tagged firewall, or I could call it cookies if I wanted to, it doesn't matter. You could say, if tag cookies, render this configuration. And so you could be faithful to that common, but use whatever your vernacular is to generate that tag that says, if this tag, do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so you, one step above that, can you use a script to assign uh, tags? So for instance, if the name contains switch, 
put it in the switch group. If the name contains firewall, does that work? I think that you could do it alternatively. You could, I don't know if that works, but you could say if the name switch. I don't think you would have to go, if you wanted to group them, you could use a tag. If you're trying to, you're trying to auto create the tag. I don't want to have to go through 310 devices and say, okay, this one's a switch and I'm going to do that. And this one's a firewall and I'm going to give this this tag. I mean, that's, that defeats the purpose, right? Yeah. So essentially yeah. you need to script that uh, same way I did in this demo with an input file that essentially translates into REST API that fits this information into our, uh, into our product. So you, you can script that. We didn't build we scripted this, this 310. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or you can go in the GUI and say, okay, I, I can select uh, these devices. Uh, you select a group yeah. and then you add a tag. So you have all these dynamic tags. Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. So, like, so if you, if you, form, then equal something. Yeah. Our, yeah. our regex on the host name, a lot of times the host name contains a letter or two that indicates a role in the thing, and then you want to tag. I assume you, you prefer tags over regex for, for stuff. Yeah, so, I think you have but both you need to generate it in some way. Mm -hmm. You have op both options. If you need to explicitly put a stamp on that object, uh, then you need to look uh, at these names uh, and uh, either populate this information using REST API, or you can do it visually in the GUI, filter by some uh, regex, uh, select all, uh, and add okay. this tag into that. So you have both options. If you want to do it programmatically inside these Jinja templates, uh, you don't even need tag in that case. You can say if host name start with uh, this, uh, then do render this other configuration. So uh, you have both options essentially. Okay, and then the other deployment model that's similar to what she's talking about there is, I do want this to go to every device eventually, but I'm a scaredy cat, so I want to do it <laughs> 20 or 30 at a time. Yeah. I can, uh, can, I, can I, yeah. I, yeah. I will show you the opposite of that, uh, but essentially it's the same. I'm going to show you later how, what happens if I want to put a station in maintenance mode. So I'm going to select one station and drain the configuration of that station so that uh, I'll show you later what that happens. It's essentially the opposite of what you just uh, described, right? So you select a subset of the system, you mark them into some state, and that means, okay, push the configuration on this state or uh, remove them from the, from, uh, from the network, essentially. So you, you can do both. But I'm going to show you that uh, example, something that is close to that. And then uh, does this commit process support the, the Juniper commit confirm process too? Uh, I Speaking of being a scaredy cat. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, the, okay, the agent uh, that uh, eventually connects to the device under the hood is doing that. Yeah, so, so we have, um, I, I was wondering if this was going to come up, so... <laughs> See if you were the guy who's broken the network. Yeah, I, I was like, this is going to come up. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, as he said, we have, this is an API client and there's some workflows that we have to work through in validation. So we don't have that capability through our API or through the UI, but we do have that capability through the CLI. So we have an Appster CLI that allows you to do essentially the commit confirm mm -hmm. that allows you to check whether or not that this is, uh, if Junos is going to bark if you've, if you've messed anything up. And right. so that, that is allowed through the CLI. from the network because you forgot something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thanks. I have one quick, sure. I, I, kind of breaking away from all of this, just an underlying question. Sure. So you just pushed one change 310 times. What is underlying this demo right here? Are these virtual switches? Are yes. there 310 virtual switches out yep. there cabled together? Yes. And that's what you pushed into? Yes. Okay. yes. 310 virtual devices that are deploy, deployed using our internal infrastructure across probably a bunch of servers, maybe five to 10 uh, physical servers. Cable, the links are cabled together uh, using hypervisor capabilities. And uh, uh, actually I'm SSH into the device, uh, uh, the, the terminal. I'm gonna show you uh, in a bit trace route. Uh, this CLI is uh, showing up because uh, there is a real device uh, uh, giving me SSH access into that. Okay, so it is 310, you yes. didn't push to 309 phantom devices and no, no. SSHing no, no, no. just that. You can one. pick a random one that I show you, and I, 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 I can show you again SSH into that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Scott Sned, and I'm a longtime Juniper guy. Um, I didn't come over with Appster, I was here before. And I can say these guys have pushed the limit on virtual Junos. So if you guys that have been following along with Juniper for a while, you know we've had these virtual QFX, virtual Junos, little tools that we 
share around and select places and use in certain scenarios in certain labs, but with a whole lot of caveats to say, don't do that, don't touch that. What Appster has forced Juniper to do is really focus on that platform to make sure it's scalable. And that will affect you guys directly at the end user in the near future. But today, what these guys are doing is one of the largest scale virtual Junos demos that we've used you know, publicly yet. So yes, this is all virtual Junos, virtual QFX is running in his lab. Cool, very cool. Yeah, essentially when I uh, was building this demo, my, my goal was to twofold. One, push the limit of uh, how much uh, can threefold scale as a test engineer. And second, uh, how far I can go with uh, the infrastructure we built, uh, the test infrastructure, how large this topology can be. <laughs> so, and uh, essentially they- Buy more servers for the lab. <laughs> 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 One last question. No, that, so was why 310? Oh, essentially this is the, I, I got the, the input file of the entire London subway system. Okay. So there is an entity called Transport for London that uh, uh, makes this, uh, this uh, data public, public. So I had this JSON file with the un all the stations apparently 310. I'm not sure how recent that number is, but it's fairly accurate to the real number. And, and uh, when I build this topology, I say, okay, I'm gonna deploy as many routers as this file is telling me. Right. And then uh, with Freeform, I'm pushing the configuration, define uh, how, uh, how these devices should be configured. Okay, so it wasn't a technical breakpoint that was just the, the data. No, that no, essentially, no, it's just I have 300 <laughs> out of memory at that. <laughs> <laughs> this started out as, out as the desire to show Freeform um, as a, the ability to build the most ridiculous network you can think of. This is not a representation of a real data center network, we certainly hope, right. but <laughs> the flexibility is there to, to model whatever you want to and, and to manage whatever topology you might need. So the 310 is, hey, we picked a known topology that we could represent. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, it could be a metro network in a city though. I mean, that's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. standard. <laughs> yep. Now, uh, this is actually the fun, uh, uh, so this uh, was all good, but one last point, uh, uh, we left the trace route. Uh, so now if I actually trace route, uh, you can see that uh, to get from, uh, from um, Abbey Road to Bow Road, uh, this is the station that you need to cross. Now trace route is not giving you uh, how long it will take to get there, right? So as I mentioned before, sometimes you have multiple commands uh, to merge this information. So where this uh, uh, output is uh, usually is in the show route, uh, where um, you can see the actually the BGP MED in action. So you can see, for example, uh, this IP address, uh, um, to reach this IP address, uh, you, uh, the BGP MED, the cumulative uh, is, uh, um, you know, uh, this uh, 5,000 value. This is quite readable. We can do something better than uh, accessing the CLI. And this is where the power of intent-based analytics come into. So I can merge these two commands uh, and present it in a way that makes sense for the user. Now I'm a user of the London subway system, so, what I want is probably get reachability information about uh, how I get from Abbey Road to, to, to um, Bow Road and how long it will take. So I have this uh, internet-based analytic probe that we wrote called uh, Route Details to Destination. And this is loading and uh, you can essentially see uh, one entry that essentially tells you three stops, uh, ETA 400, 400 uh, seconds. Uh, in, uh, it's a 400 uh, for coming from the MED attribute. Uh, we can model that uh, as seconds, one to one. And these are the stops that I'm gonna make. West, uh, West Ham, Brownlee, um, uh, by Bow, and Bow Road. So this is essentially uh, pretty fine the output from multiple uh, sources and, uh, and giving you something that is presentable to the user. And um, now as a next step, uh, if you go back to the map, right? I want to show you, uh, now, as I mentioned, I'm going south, right? So I'm going to West Ham. What happens if, uh, for example, this station is not uh, working, there is some uh, work in progress, uh, uh, how this uh, impacts my, my reachability? So let's have BGP do its job and tell me which station I should, I should take uh, to get to the same destination if, uh, you know, for example, in that moment, one station is down. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I want to bring down this station West Ham. I can do it in two ways. Either I go in the SSH into the switch and I shut down interfaces, I reboot them, or uh, if this is a control maintenance mode, I can actually model it in the product to do that. So let's uh, define now the semantics of putting a station in maintenance mode, right? So for example, 
I can decide that whenever a station is in maintenance mode, I just bring down all the, its interfaces. So if I go back into the config plate modeling uh, um, this uh, configuration, I can uh, um, decide in the interfa interfaces section, for example, uh, and this is just to show you a bit of the dynamic completion, the editing part for a very simple use case. So I can do if deploy mode equal equal and deploy, I'll put this uh, interface in disabled. So I, I simply render uh, the command uh, disabled, the statement disabled, so and if. So I'm changing my configuration, sorry uh, if uh, it's a bit, uh, okay. Thank you. So I can change this configuration to, to say, okay, if uh, from the GUI, from the abstract product, I'm decided, uh, I'm deciding a controlled maintenance mode. So I'm gonna select a station and put it uh, in undeploy mode. The semantic of that uh, is uh, I simply shut down all the interfaces. So this is a loop and uh, basically it's doing this for each interface. That's what this is telling you. Mm -hmm. So I can update this config template now. And uh, uh, this should trigger, a, uh, this will trigger a, an uncommitted change. I can, uh, uh, and it's showing you the diff. So this, uh, this is essentially what, what I just changed. Um, I can, uh, commit this and say defining semantics of mint mode. Yeah. I commit this change and uh, nothing should happen in this case because I haven't put any station in maintenance mode. So you will see that actually this hasn't triggered any config change, but it's there already. So I can go to the uh, station. Uh, it was West Ham, right? Uh, let me, I can go to this station actually. I can select deploy mode and deploy in this case. This will trigger another change that I can commit uh, West um, maintenance mode. And uh, from the GUI, you will see um, this number uh, 309. 309 means essentially 309 devices are running the service config, so what should be in the optimal case, and uh, minus one, uh, which is in maintenance mode, essentially. Now, if we have done things correctly, and I'm sure uh, uh, this configuration has landed on the devices, uh, you will see that uh, uh, trace route command has changed. And uh, you can actually see now there, is, uh, there are four hops, uh, and I'm going north uh, now through Strat Stratford High Street. So if we go back into the, the, the graph, uh, I can show you visually what, uh, what this means. So essentially West Ham is down, right? So I'm forced to go north and uh, it's going to the station called uh, Stratford High Street. And uh, how this impacts uh, the time that it takes to get there, IDA will tell us. So, uh, I can go into the same probe now. I can get the raw details. And now you can see that the output has changed here in real time. And it's telling me ETA now is 844 seconds as opposed to 400 before. And this is uh, uh, your, uh, your new route, essentially. So again, I'm merging uh, output from, uh, from multiple devices and presented it to, into a sensible way. And uh, um, this is essentially um, how you can manage day two operations on devices. It's describing uh, uh, how you will do it. Now, <clears throat> suppose I need to redo the demo tomorrow to some other audience. I want to undo everything and uh, I can use Time Voyager to get uh, to the configuration that was there before this demo. So uh, you see, this is, this is where we start. Who needs a DNS? So this was the status before that. I can go restore this, jump to this revision. Uh, roll back. Uh, I haven't pushed this configuration yet because Upstream is showing me what this rollback contains uh, compared to the current running state, right? And you can see three changes essentially. In the config template, uh, we are removing the section defining the, the, the semantics of undeploy, right? So this section that, was, that now is there, uh, it won't be there uh, if we push this configuration. Um, we are uh, changing the 
semantic of systems, so we're removing the host mapping. So I had this static DNS thing uh, that was there. And uh, West Ham station, which is currently in undeployed mode, it will be in service later. So I can push this configuration back to initial state. And this now will trigger again a configuration change on uh, 310 devices. So I'm pushing again configuration 310 devices here. Takes a couple of UR refreshes to get there. And uh, uh, almost there. So what if I want to go back five, but keep one of the four, keep number four? Can... <laughs> so, <laughs> so essentially, when you do uh, restore, you are staging these changes. Okay. You can still go in the stations uh, or the config template and make other changes. Uh, eventually, what you see as a diff uh, is the composition of these two actions. So when you do rollback, uh, it will put the, this change in the staging area for you, and you can work on top of it. Okay. That's essentially so, yeah, so that I can plug like, back in the one that I need. To so you, when you roll back, you'll see all the changes. You just remove the ones that you don't want to change. I or guess. you make a you make a new template, or or a template change that does the exclusion that you want to do. Yeah. yeah. The way that I think of it is it, it it's more akin to version control, whereby you can check out a branch or roll back to a branch and then make changes to that branch. So what he did is rolled back, had something in stage and you can say, well, I wanna make a change to this branch. So I want something close, but different. So you can branch again and make that as a commit. Well, what I'm thinking of is you have five provisioning people. We've provisioned five things in the, in the course of the day and it's number three or five that I need to get rid of. Yeah, there's some <laughs> manual. The others. <laughs> yeah, there's some manual, just as if you were checking out a branch, there's some manual, uh, what is it called when you uh, uh, try to get your branch back? Uh, is that too? Yeah, there's some manual work that you have to do to get to that. If you're trying to intermerge multiple different branches and you mm -hmm. want some subset of those, there's some work that you have to, to uh, cherry possibly picking. do. Huh? Cherry picking. Cherry picking, that's it. Cherry I <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you're kind of scaring them with this key terminology now. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. Essentially, if, you, if you're familiar with, uh, with, with Git, it's more or less, it's a simplified version because uh, here you have a linear change, right? So you have a uh, uh, commit roll back uh, to the same line, essentially. But uh, once they are in the, stage, in the staging area, you, 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 can, uh, you can add on top of that. And then uh, that's the one you want to commit. And uh, yeah, just so that we know that uh, configuration is, uh, is back to initial state, trace route to bow road is no longer working because we removed the, the static cost mapping. So I, I, I can no longer do that. 